Hello everyone and welcome to today's Mondac webinar in association with Paranam Law Associates who will be exploring international commercial arbitration. My name is Dan Sampeo and I'm joined by a brilliant panel to take us through today's discussion. Bujit Tidki is a senior partner at Paranam Law Associates where she leads the commercial, maritime and technology disputes practice. She was enrolled as an advocate of the Bar Council of Maharashtra and Goa in 2005 and since has advised and represented Indian and international conglomerates before various courts in India, as well as in Indian and foreign seated arbitrations. Krushi Barkawala is currently a counsel with the commercial disputes team at Paranam Law. Krushi specializes in litigation, commercial insolvency and general civil and shipping with significant ex experience in all aspects of litigation and arbitration, ranging from drafting pleadings, attending hearings, preparing for trials, settlement, and general advisory work. Anisha Bane Bengali is a partner in commercial disputes practice at Paranam Law. She specializes in intellectual property laws, media laws, commercial litigation, and arbitration. She has extensive experience of representing and advising both domestic and international clients in arbitration proceedings. And completing today's panel is Rima Desai. Rima is currently a senior associate in the civil and commercial litigation team of Paranam Law with a focus on debt recovery and insolvency matters, alternate dispute resolution, as well as pre-litigation advisory. She advises clients on disputes involving commercial contracts, shareholders disputes, civil disputes, and recovery of debts. Now, before I hand over to the panel, a housekeeping item, you can submit questions to our panel by typing them into the questions pane of the toolbar on the right hand side of your page. The panel will endeavour to answer as many questions as possible during our Q&A session at the end of the session. It's now my pleasure to hand you over to Pooja, Krushi, Manisha and Rima to begin. Thank you. Thank you, Dan, for introducing us and giving us this opportunity. And hello to all our viewers. I would like to introduce with the first slide about what we are going to talk on. Our first topic is going to be on introduction on the interim measures under the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. We will also be covering the nature of relief that can be granted under this act, as well as the applicability of Section 9 and the implied exclusion of Section 9 under the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. These topics will be covered by me and my colleague Krushi will be covering the topic of emergency arbitrations. Now, before we move on to the topic of the nature of interim release one can obtain in India in an international commercial arbitration, let's first understand the prerequisites for an arbitration to be classified as an international commercial arbitration. International commercial arbitration is defined in India under the Arbitration and Conciliation Act of 1996. This act was subsequently amended to make arbitrations in India cost effective, speedy, with minimum intervention from court. In India, for a dispute to be classified as an international commercial arbitration, the arbitration must arise from a legal relationship between the parties. The legal relationship may or may not be contractual in nature. It should also be considered to be a commercial dispute under the laws in India. Now, commercial dispute is not defined under the Arbitration Act, but one finds its definition in the Commercial Courts Act of 2015. This is also an Indian statute. One of the parties to the dispute also is required to be an individual who is a national of any country other than India or is habitually residing in any country other than India. It will also be a corporate body, a company incorporated in any country other than India, an association or body of individuals whose central management and control is exercised in any country, again, other than India. It could also be a government of a foreign country. A party interested in seeking interim relief in an international arbitration is required to file for an application under Section 9 of this Arbitration Act. Only parties to an existing arbitration agreement can approach Indian courts for interim relief. However, interim reliefs can also be sought against third parties and non-signatories to the arbitration agreement, provided 
the interim release sought must be with regard to the subject matter or in connection with the arbitral proceeding. As long as the interim orders are with regards to the subject matter, courts in India have granted reliefs against such third party. In order to secure its interest, the party may choose to file this application either before or during or any time after making the arbitral award, but before it's enforced under Section 36 of the Act. However, there are very two important things to be bear in mind before a party decides whether it wants to file an application or not. Firstly, if a tribunal has been constituted, the court may not entertain an application under Section 9 unless it finds that circumstances exist which may render the remedy provided under Section 17 efficacious. Secondly, before the commencement of the arbitral proceeding, a court passes an order for any interim measure of protection, the arbitral proceedings have to commence within a period of 90 days from the date of such an order or within such further time as the court may determine. Indian courts can grant the interim release to a party applying to it depending on the specific case made out by the applicant party. However, the nature of release being sought by the applicant have to be necessarily be in relation to the subject matter of the arbitration and can only be applied for by the parties to a valid arbitration agreement. Now let's see what are the reliefs that parties can seek. Parties can seek reliefs like preservation, interim custody, or sale of any goods, which are the subject matter of the arbitration agreement, securing the amount in dispute, detention, preservation or inspection of any property or thing, which is the subject matter of such an arbitration, interim injunction or the appointment of a receiver, and any other interim measure of protection which the court feels it's necessary to be awarded. Parties can, before or during arbitral proceedings, or at any time after making of the arbitral award, but before it's enforced, apply to a court for interim reliefs in an Indian court. This is equally true for foreign seated arbitration. Section 9 would apply not only before and during the arbitral proceedings, but even prior to its enforcement, even though where it may not be enforced under Section 36 of the Act. The other important thing to consider before approaching the Indian courts under Section 9 is to understand whether there is any express or implied bar under the arbitration agreement impeding a party from approaching an Indian court for ad interim or interim release. My colleague Pooja will throw some light on the interim release that party can seek pending the enforcement of a foreign award shortly. But in the meanwhile, look at, let's look at some provisions. The Arbitration Act under Section 2.2 carves out a specific proviso which states that unless the parties have agreed not to go before the Indian court, either expressly or impliedly, provisions of Section 9 of the Act shall also apply to international commercial arbitrations. Even if the place of arbitration is outside India, an arbitral award made or to be made in such a place is enforceable and also recognized under the provisions of Part 2 of this Act. Section 9 is applicable to all Indian seated arbitrations, whereas in foreign seated arbitrations, the parties can by agreement exclude the applicability of Section 9. This exclusion could be expressly made in the arbitration agreement itself, or there could be an implied exclusion of Section 9. The applicability of Section 9 in international commercial arbitrations having a foreign seat is subject to two specific conditions. The parties must not have expressly or impliedly excluded the applicability of such provisions. Now, this can be gathered from the facts and circumstances of each case. The arbitral award should be made in such a place which is enforceable and recognized under Part 2 of the Act. The award must be made in a country which is a party to the New York Convention or the Geneva Convention and must be recognized by the central government of India. An important judgment of the Indian Supreme Court, which clarified the maintainability of an application under Section 9, is a case where the arbitration was between two Indian parties having a foreign seat. 
This was a case of Parcel Win Solutions Private Limited versus GE Power Conversion India Private Limited. The court held in that case that Section 9 would also be maintainable by virtue of Section 2, Subsection 2 of the Act, even when the arbitration is between two Indian parties having a foreign seat. Having said that, there are cases where there can be an implied exclusion of Section 9 in a foreign seated arbitration. And hence, parties in such a scenario cannot approach Indian courts for any interim relief. Let's understand when this happens. For example, certain institutional rules restrict the parties from approaching judicial authorities or state courts for interim relief. When parties accept these rules to govern their arbitrations, it would have the effect of implied excluding Section 9 to the extent provided in the rules. The law to this extent has been clarified by the Delhi High Court in India in the case of Ashwini Minda versus Yushin Limited, where the parties had approached the Delhi High Court under Section 9 after the appointment of an emergency arbitrator under the Japan Commercial Arbitration Association rules. Declining to grant any interim relief, the Delhi High Court held that parties having excluded the applicability of Part 1 of the Act and agreeing to be governed by different rules and procedures, binding on the parties and having invoked the same, jurisdiction of this court under Section 9 of the Act cannot be invoked and the petition is not maintainable. The decision of the Delhi High Court was subsequently challenged before the division bench of the same court and then later before the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court upheld this decision. This, however, does not mean that Section 9 is impliedly excluded by merely choosing a foreign seated institutional arbitration. Therefore, it is evident that when parties agree to settle their disputes through arbitration, they must exercise caution and ensure that there is no scope of ambiguity in the language of the arbitration clause so as to avoid any issues later. Specifically, while choosing the seat of arbitration and the applicable law, the parties need to see that their desired seat of arbitration and applicable law is explicitly captured under the contract. As one can see, agreeing to vague arbitration clauses may lead to extremely confusing situations and delayed results. I will now pass on the floor to my colleague, Ms. Krushi Barfiwala, so tell us more about emergency arbitration and other aspects of interim relief. Krushi, over you, to Monisha. you now. Thank you, Monisha. So during today's webinar, I will be addressing the topic of emergency awards. The primary benefit of emergency arbitration is the speed. Generally, the emergency arbitrator must render an award within 14 to 15 days of appointment. Though in some cases before court, courts do grant relief, add interim relief on the very first date of hearing, it is highly improbable that in most of the other cases within 14 to 15 days will an interim relief be granted. This makes emergency arbitration an extremely attractive option. So whilst the concept of emergency arbitrations has gained popularity, sufficient safeguards have also been put in place to ensure that the age-old provisions pertaining to interim release are not diluted. There are rules of several arbitral institutions which provide for emergency arbitration, such as the SIAC, LCI, Hong Kong International Arbitration Center. The interplay between the interim reliefs and the emergency awards also finds a place in these in the rules of these institutions, which specifically provide that emergency arbitration provisions do not prevent, substitute, or impliedly waive the rights of parties to apply to a competent state court for interim or conservatory measures. The Indian Arbitration Act does not provide for emergency arbitrations. Therefore, an emergency arbitration can be invoked only if parties have agreed to institutional arbitrations. However, despite finding no mention, emergency awards have been held to be valid. The Delhi High Court, in the case of Future Retail versus Amazon, held that the concept of emergency arbitration in an international commercial arbitration is not contrary to the scheme of the Arbitration Act. 
the CIA crews provide an option to the aggrieved party to either approach the emergency arbitrator for interim relief or to approach a judicial authority for the same prior to constitution of the arbitral tribunal. The Supreme Court as well rendered a monumental decision in the case of Amazon Investments versus Future Retail, holding that an award passed by an emergency arbitrator is equivalent to an interim order of the tribunal under Section 17.1 of the Act and can be enforced as an order of the court under Section 17.2 of the Act. With that brief background, I will be speaking on a few landmark judgments which succinctly put forth the prevalent position in India. The Delhi High Court lent a purposive interpretation to this entire concept in the year 2016 in the case of Raffles Design versus Educom Professional Education Limited. In this case, disputes arose between the parties out of a share purchase agreement. Clause 15 of that agreement provided that the contract would be governed in accordance with the laws of Singapore. The seat of arbitration was Singapore and the CIAC rules were made applicable. The petitioner initiated arbitration proceedings in Singapore. The petitioner also filed an application for appointing an emergency arbitrator. On this application, the emergency arbitrator granted certain interim reliefs. Subsequently, a consent award was passed between the parties. However, thereafter, the respondent acted in contravention to the emergency award passed. The petitioner therefore filed an application before the Delhi High Court under Section 9 of the Arbitration Act, seeking interim reliefs akin to the ones which had been granted by the interim emergency arbitrator. The maintainability of this petition was challenged. The court considered that the court considered whether the petition was permitted to whether the petitioner was permitted to approach the court for interim relief, considering it had already procured an emergency award in the arbitration. It was observed that the SIAC rules are clearly in conformity with the unicetral model law, and they permit the parties to approach the court for interim relief. The inescapable conclusion is that since the parties had agreed that the arbitration had to be conducted as per SIAC rules, they had impliedly agreed that it would be incompatible for them to approach the courts for, it would not be incompatible for them to approach the courts for interim relief. This would also include the courts of Singapore. The court further added, needless to say, that the question whether the interim order should be granted under Section 9 or not would have to be considered independent of the, of the ruling of the arbitral tribunal. Recently, in the year 2020, this Raffles judgment was quite the center point of discussion in proceedings which were initiated by Ashwini Minda before the Delhi High Court against Yushin Limited. In this case, the single judge and the division bench of the Delhi High Court considered whether the appellants ought to be permitted to proceed with the, their request for interim measures under Section 9 after having, after having failed to obtain similar reliefs before the emergency arbitrator under the JCAA rules and even after the constitution of the arbitral tribunal. The JCAA rules, the, the, the Japan Commercial Arbitration Association. Now, those rules also provide that the tribunal has ample power to grant interim measures of protection, notwithstanding the findings of the emergency arbitrator. And they also make it clear that emergency measures are deemed to be interim measures granted by the tribunal. And thus, once the applicants are elect, have elected to approach the emergency arbitrator, they cannot file the instant petition. The court also noted on that on a reading of the Section 9 proceedings which were filed, it clearly showed that the appellant regarded the present proceeding as a remedy against the order of the emergency arbitrator. The court considered the general mandate of the law that, emergency, that interim measures ought not to be granted by courts once arbitral tribunals have been constituted. It is only when the remedy before the tribunal lacks efficacy will the courts intervene and a party can seek interim measures from the court. 
This reduces the interference of the court and, re and declogs the judiciary. The court held that a foreign, a party to a foreign seated arbitration has the option of seeking interim measures of protection in the Indian courts or going to the seat court or the tribunal for interim relief. The question that arises in this case is whether having chosen to invoke the JCAA process and go to emergency arbitration and having failed to obtain relief, the party can seek the same relief in Section 9 proceedings. The court observed, and I quote, neither a purposive interpretation nor the legislative history of the 2015 amendment reveal an intention to permit such a course. The option to seek an interim relief under Section 9.3 only arises when an emergency order has been made by an arbitrator and not in a situation where the arbitrator has rejected the relief. In this context, the reliance on the raffle's judgment was also distinguished. Basically, in court, the party who filed these proceedings before the single judge placed heavy reliance on the raffle's judgment to contend that even though an arbit even though the emergency arbitrator has rejected the relief, the present Section 9 proceedings are still maintainable. On different counts, we have the single judge and the division bench of the Delhi High Court, which distinguish this reliance. The single judge made a very pertinent observation whilst discussing raffles that unlike in the case of Ashwini Minda, in the raffles case, the rules governing arbitration were SIAC rules, which permit the parties to approach the courts for interim relief. The division bench also ultimately held that the reliance is misplaced. It went on to further observe that the significant difference between a Raffles case and the Ashwini Minda case is that the emergency arbitrator in the Raffles design had granted an interim measure in favor of the petitioner, which had also been enforced before the High Court of Singapore under the International Arbitration Act. The Section 9 petition was filed because the respondent failed to adhere to the terms of the order that was passed. However, in the instant Ashwini Minda case, the observations would only arise when an emergency order has been made by an arbitrator and not in a situation where the arbitrator has rejected that relief. Ashwini Minda further appealed from this particular division bench order to the Supreme Court. Ultimately, the Supreme Court also refused to intervene and the findings of the division bench of the Delhi High Court still continue to hold good. In the same breath of striking a balance between interests of parties and minimal interference and according a, a primacy to emergency arbitrations, the Bombay High Court was seized of an extremely interesting matter. The court had to consider an application for interim relief by a party pursuant to obtaining reliefs by the emergency arbit from the emergency arbitrator in Singapore. This was the case of Plus Holdings versus Zeitgeist Entertainment Limited. Disputes arose pertaining to the termination of an agreement for broadcasting the rights of a mo movie, Hotel Mumbai. Plus Holdings initiated arbitration under the SIAC rules and also invoked the emergency interim relief provisions. Zeitgeist claimed that the rights had been reverted to the original owner, Hotel Mumbai Private Limited, who had entered into an agreement with Netflix for the release of the movie in India and SARC countries. The emergency arbitrator made a preliminary order and then a final order, which was subject to the ultimate decision of the tribunal and restrained Zeitgeist from entering into any agreement or conferring any rights on any person inconsistent with the rights of plus holding. Later, Plus holding applied to the Bombay High Court for interim measures under Section 9 of the Act. Plus holding also joined Netflix as a party. The bench heard the matter at the ad interim stage and observed that it appears that the rights of plus holding in regard to the film have been sufficiently recognized in the emergency award, although granted against Zeitgeist. Since the matter needs further examination, it would be necessary to grant an ad interim protection to the petitioner till the adjourned date of hearing. 
Accordingly, the judge restrained Hotel Mumbai's private limited from entering into any agreement or creating any third party rights in the movie and, uh, and seeking, the uh, seeking the release of the movie in SARC countries. And since Netflix had already, uh, had already stopped exhibiting the movie, Netflix was deleted as a party. Ultimately, these disputes were settled between the parties. So on a reading of these landmark judgments, one can conclude that the courts have been instrumental in striking a balance between the interest of parties and the legislative intent to ensure minimal interference with arbitration proceedings. Indian courts have also time and again accorded primacy to the timely and effective interim remedy available to parties through emergency arbitrations. In our experience, we have also seen courts in India have been proactive and have taken a harmonious stand between interim reliefs under Section 9 of the Act and emergency arbitrations. On that note, I will now hand it over to my colleagues Pooja and Reema, who will take everyone through the provisions pertaining to enforcement. Thank you, Krushi. A critical aspect of international alternate dispute resolution and cross-border commercial litigation concerns the enforcement of awards and orders obtained in these proceedings. Whilst I will be providing a brief overview of the procedure for enforcement of foreign awards, my colleague Ms. Pooja Tirge will be shedding light on the procedural implications and considerations of enforcement of foreign awards in India. Whilst the enforcement of foreign decrees in India is governed by the Code of Civil Procedure, the enforcement of foreign awards in India is governed by Part 2 of the Arbitration and Conciliation Act. Part 2 of the Act has relevant procedures in conjunction with and keeping in mind the fact that India is a signatory to the New York Convention as well as the Geneva Convention uh, for enforcement of foreign awards. Section 44 of the, uh, of the Arbitration Act defines a foreign award. As per Section 44, a foreign award has three basic requirements. And it is an award that arises out of differences between the parties, having legal relationship, whether contractual or not, considered commercial as per Indian laws, and in pursuance of a written arbitral agreement governed by either of the conventions, and arising in a country which is either a signatory to these conventions or is a reciprocating territory as certified by the central government of India in accordance with section 44A of the Code of Civil Procedure. Now coming to which court has jurisdiction to entertain enforcement proceedings. Uh, a, a conjoint reading of section 47 and 48 of the Act along with section 10 of the Commercial Courts Act 2015 makes it clear that the High Court uh, that the uh, commercial division of the High Court will have jurisdiction to entertain enforcement proceedings. However, in order to determine, uh, in order to determine the, which High Court will have jurisdiction to entertain enforcement proceedings, the applicant will have to first identify the uh, the jurisdiction in which the uh, the assets of the judgment creditor lies. Uh, there, there may arise two situations, one where the award, uh, the award creditor is unaware of the assets or uh, the, uh, where the assets of the, uh, of the award debtor lie. In such a situation, they may file an, a relevant application for disclosure before the, uh, before the court in which the enforcement proceedings have to be filed. Secondly, there may also arise a situation where the assets of the award debtor lie in multiple jurisdictions. In such a case, uh, in such a case, as the Delhi High Court has held in the case of bulk trading versus Dalmia cement, if the, uh, uh, if the assets of the award debtor are located in a territorial jurisdiction of more than one court, the award holder can file execution proceedings simultaneously in all competent courts. This brings us to the, uh, to the question of limitation for filing enforcement proceedings. Whilst there has been uh, uh, there have been contradictory judgments passed by several high courts. The Supreme Court of India in the case of Government of India versus Vedanta Limited has finally settled that the limitation period for executing a foreign award is three years from when the right to apply accrues. Therefore, the applicant must file the proceedings within, uh, within three years. The validity of a foreign award also has to be determined at the initial stage prior to the enforcement of the award under section 47 of the act the court uh, is required to examine whether the award that is filed and seeks and is sought to be enforced is actually a foreign award 
in such a situation in accordance with uh, section 47 the applicant uh, the applicant ought to file the original award or the original agreement uh, or a certified copy of the agreement and all other evidence which is necessary to prove that the award is a foreign award however in the case of pec limited versus osvalk shipping the supreme court has held that an application for enforcement will not be dismissed merely because it was filed without complying with the, requ uh, the requisitions under Section 47. The Supreme Court, in, a, uh, in an yet another pro-enforcement stance, has, uh, has interpreted the, the term shall to mean may at the initial stage, uh, at the initial stage of enforcement, thereby holding that the uh, that documents which uh, which are mandated under section 47 may be submitted at a later stage and the court may uh, and the court may consider these documents uh, even thereafter ultimately pursuant to the rejection of challenges to the enforcement of a foreign award once the award creditor uh, uh, has satisfied the court on its enforceability the award shall deem to be a decree of that court in accordance with section 49 of the act on uh, upon the successful culmination the question of payments has also been considered uh, has also been considered by the courts in india Payments that are being made by a person in India to a person outside India may require the permission of the Reserve Bank of India in usual course. In case of foreign awards, which have to be enforced in India in the Indian currency, the rate of conversion expressly provided for in the award or in the un underlying contract has to be uh, considered for the purposes of fixing and determining the forex rate at which the payments under such award have to be made. In these scenarios, the executing court would be bound to follow the exchange rate prevalent on the date provided for in the award or the contract. In the absence of an express provision, the effective date for considering the exchange rates is the date of rejection of objections or to the enforcement of the foreign award or when all remedies, including appeals, revision petitions against enforcement of a foreign award stand exhausted. Ultimately, this overview reveals that the statutory procedure for enforcement of foreign awards is fairly straightforward and a constant endeavor is made by the parliament, the courts and the arbitration community to aid a pro-enforcement environment in India. With this, I now invite Ms. Pooja Tedke to shed light on the practical aspects of enforcement of foreign awards. Hi, Pooja. I, I believe you're on mute at the moment. Just whilst Pooja is um, Sorry. getting your set up. Thank you, Pooja. Brilliant. Sorry, I was having some trouble unmuting my microphone. Thank you, Reema. Um, uh, taking off from where Reema left, uh, I'm going to be dealing with uh, certain important questions that arise in relation to enforcement of foreign awards and some practical implications and considerations to be kept in mind. Vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the enforcement of um, uh, a foreign award under Section 9, uh, the provision uh, in the Arbitration Act provides that a party can apply for interim measures at any time after the making of the arbitral award but before it is enforced in accordance with Section 36. The Bombay High Court, in a recent judgment in Dirk India Private Limited versus Maharashtra State Power Generation Company Limited, while discussing certain vital facets of the provision, highlighted the importance of there being an immediate and proximate nexus between the interim measures that are sought and the arbitral proceeding. 
Such interim measures when sought after an arbitral award is made, but before it is enforced, is intended to safeguard the fruit of the proceedings until the eventual enforcement of the foreign award. Therefore, what is contemplated is the preservation of assets for enforcement of the final award. The relevant portion of the judgment, I quote, says, it is, it is intended that section nine must safeguard the fruit of the proceedings until the eventual enforcement of the award. Thus making it very clear that section nine is meant to be exercised only when there is genuine cause or an apprehension that a party may not uh, have the capacity to, to fulfill his obligation under a foreign award. This view of the Bombay High Court has been followed by subsequent Bombay High Court judgments as well, and also been cited approvingly by the Supreme Court in Hindustan Construction Company Limited versus the Union of India. Now we come to um, one of the most uh, widely used reasons uh, to object uh, to the enforcement of a foreign award in India. Whilst the track record of the Indian courts in terms of enforcing awards under the New York Convention has largely been unblemished, um, Indian courts have on most occasions followed a pro-enforcement approach. Yet, parties often use the reason of public policy to oppose the enforcement of a foreign award. Broadly speaking, the challenges to a foreign award can best be divided into two categories. The first being procedural challenges and the second being challenges with re which relate to enforcing the country's norms of public policy. In India, until recently, parties have particularly focused on the ground of public policy as a means to successfully avoid the enforcement of a foreign award. However, in recent years, the scope of the challenge on the grounds of public policy has been narrowed down considerably by the courts. For example, in 2017, the Delhi High Court in the case of Crew City categorically held that while permission from the Reserve Bank of India for remitting funds outside India in furtherance of a foreign award would be required, a mere violation of a provision of Indian law in this case, the FEMA violation, are not grounds to oppose enforcement of foreign awards and would not constitute a violation of public policy. This judgment reinforces the principle that the court cannot act as an appellate court, but is meant to exercise review powers at best whilst examining foreign awards. Recently, the Supreme Court passed a landmark judgment in the case of Vijay Karya and others versus Prismium. The issue in this case was whether the violation of FEMA in the implementation of a foreign award should be construed as a contravention of the public policy of India. Whilst the earlier judgment that I cited was a judgment of the Delhi High Court, this one is a judgment of the Supreme Court and therefore lays down the law of the land. The SE decided this issue by holding that a rectifiable breach under FEMA, which is the Foreign Exchange Management Act, cannot be held to be a violation of the fundamental policy of Indian law. The Supreme Court advanced the international jurisprudence on Article 5 of the New York Convention by holding that a residual discretion remains with the court to enforce a foreign award despite there being grounds for res resisting a foreign award and those grounds having been made out by a party. The court re-emphasized the pervasive object of the New York Convention of precluding the national laws from shadowing the due course of the arbitration. The verdict shifted the burden of proof of enforcement of the award onto the opposing party as the court observed that the public policy of an involved country cannot be used as an excuse for setting aside the award. Thus, in many ways, 
This judgment reaffirmed the pro-enforcement stance of Indian courts with respect to foreign awards. Let's um, one of the uh, one of the very common obstacles that arise while enforcing foreign awards are uh, when uh, the uh, the award debtor uh, does not have the funds or the means to satisfy the award, or, or it is probably a shell company or one of you know uh, or a subsidiary of a larger group, uh, and therefore may not have the assets to uh, fully satisfy. Uh, its liabilities under the award. What happens in such cases? Can foreign awards be enforced against group companies and non-signatories to the arbitration agreement? Though piercing the corporate veil in the enforcement of awards is not the norm, in a, a recent case, uh, 2021, in Delhi, uh, Delhi Airport Metro Express Private Limited versus Delhi Metro Rail Corporation Limited, the Delhi High Court enforced an arbitral award against the Union Ministry of the Government of India and Government of National Capital Territory of Delhi, the two shareholders of the Delhi Metro Rail Corporation Limited, when DMRC was unable to pay its dues under an arbitral award passed against it. This was a significant judgment considering that the parties concerned are uh, government entities. Um, very often uh, people have the perception that if you're, you're, you're up against uh, a state company or a state entity, uh, you're going to be dragged into court for a very long time even though you succeed in an arbitration. But this judgment disproves that notion. The Delhi High Court reasoned as follows, and I quote, the DMRC must necessarily be recognized as being a mere alter ego of those two shareholders, both by virtue of the capital invested in the corporation, as well as the control vested and exercised by them over its affairs, the union ministry and the GNCTD must be recognized in law as being in absolute control and the directing mind. They cannot hide behind the veil of corporate personality, especially when it comes to discharge of binding obligations owed by DMRC. The two shareholders are not mere individuals having a business interest in a corporate venture, but sovereign governments in their own right. Governments cannot shirk from their liability to abide by binding judgments, decrees, and awards. The circumstances of the present case thus clearly mandate and warrant the corporate veil being lifted and torn apart, and for the court recognizing the GNCTD as well as the union ministry being in complete and total control of the affairs of the DMRC. So it is, um, it is a reality now in India uh, where uh, foreign awards can be enforced uh, against group companies if you're able to make out a case where uh, the judgment debtor is in complete control and the affairs are being completely directed by a parent company. Of course, um, the position may change from case to case and depending on the facts of every case, but it is definitely um, an option that's available to a judgment creditor. How about non-signatories to an arbitration agreement? If I'm a non-signatory to an arbitration agreement, can I be bound by a foreign award? In the case of Gemini Bay Transcription Private Limited versus Integrated Sales Services Limited, the Supreme Court of India rejected the submission that a foreign award would only be binding on the parties to the arbitration agreement and not on non-signatories. The Supreme Court distinguished the language of Section 35 and Section 46 of the Arbitration Act and noted that while Section 35 refers to the term parties and persons claiming under them, Section 46 which deals with circumstances under which a foreign award is binding, referred to the term persons, who may also be non-signatories to the arbitration agreement. 
As regards Section 48, the Supreme Court once again reiterated that the grounds for refusal of enforcement of a foreign award under Section 48 are to be interpreted narrowly. Unless a party can clearly demonstrate that its case comes under the purview of Section 48, 1, subsection 1 or subsection 2, a foreign award ought to be enforced in light of the pro-enforcement bias of the New York Convention, which has been duly incorporated into the provision that is Section 48. The Supreme Court distinguished the judgment of the UK Supreme Court in Dalla Real Estate and Tourism Company versus Ministry of Religious Affairs of the Government of Pakistan to hold that objections to a foreign award raised by a non-signatory to the agreement would fall outside the scope of Section 48 and the award would be binding on it. The, the Supreme Court also agreed with the judgment of the Singapore High Court in Aloe Vera of America Inc. versus Asianic Foods to hold that Section 48 of the Act relates to the scope of the arbitration agreement rather than to whether a particular person was a party to that agreement. Thus, in conclusion, it is very possible for uh, a party who is not a signatory to an arbitration agreement to be held liable to discharge liabilities under a foreign award. Finally, we come to the last option that could be available for a judgment debtor in the enforce for a, I'm sorry, for a judgment creditor in the enforcement of a foreign award. Does the Contempt of Courts Act apply in enforcement of foreign awards? With regard to foreign awards, the mere willful disobedience of the award itself does not render the offending party liable for contempt actions in India. This is because the foreign award is not a decree or order under the Contempt of Courts Act 1971. Instead, the offending party becomes liable for contempt when they willfully disobey either an order of a court during the execution of an arbitral award or an interim measure granted by a court prior to the execution of the award under Section 9 of the Act. In a recent case, a judgment passed in 2019, Vinay Prakash Singh versus Samir Gelot, the Supreme Court of India had an opportunity to deal with a matter wherein the certain parties willfully disobeyed the order of the executing court during enforcement proceedings. In this case, the offending parties violated the assurances they provided to the Delhi High Court as well as to the Supreme Court of India. It is worth noting that the basis of these assurances and undertakings, it was on the basis of these assurances and undertakings that the court had previously refrained from passing any interim measures against the offending parties. Thus, having, having violated and back backtracked from these assurances and undertakings, the courts came down heavily on the offending parties and held them to be guilty of committing contempt of court. Similarly, where a party files an application under Section 9 of the Act for interim measures prior to the enforcement of an award, contempt action can also be taken against the offending parties for breach of the interim measure granted by the court. In a recent judgment in HSPC PI Holdings Mauritius Limited versus Pradeep Shanti Prasad Jain, the Supreme Court held the offending party liable for contempt for its failure to deposit and maintain certain amounts as per an order of the Supreme Court, which emanated from an appeal originating from an order of a learned single judge of the Bombay High Court under Section 9 of the Act. The court observed, and I quote, to maintain the rule of law and majesty of justice, and so as to see that the faith and confidence of the people in judiciary is maintained, this is a fit case to entertain the present contempt proceedings and to punish the respondents under the provisions of the Contempt of Courts Act. Thus. 
proceedings under contempt of courts act can prove to be a useful tool in expediting the enforcement of an arbitration award in conclusion ultimately the enforcement of foreign awards under indian law has a narrow scope for interpretation whilst the procedural aspects remain straightforward award creditors must however bear in mind that dilatory tactics coupled with frivolous challenges in an already overburdened court system carries its own delays in the interim it is therefore important to secure protective measures such as disclosure of assets liabilities and interim reliefs as my colleagues pointed out earlier to ensure that your foreign award doesn't remain a paper decree and that the judgment creditor eventually does realize what he has been granted through the foreign award with that we end the webinar session if there are any questions we could take those Brilliant. Thank you very much, Pooja, and thank you, Manisha, Rima, and Krushi, for your insights and your knowledge today. We really appreciate it. Um, as Pooja says, we will move on to our Q&A section. I can see that there are a few questions in there, but we do have time. So if you do have a question that you want to send in, please do send it now, and we will have the opportunity to ask it to our panel. Um, our first question, um, if an Indian company does not supply a US buyer the tech docs, even though they have received payment in full, what's the US buyer's recourse? And I'm happy for anybody to jump in. Yeah, I'll take this one, Dan, thank you. It's a very interesting question. Uh, it all depends on what kind of contractual relationships are there between the party and what are the terms of the contract. If there is an alternate dispute resolution clause in the contract, then that process will have to follow. Uh, in the absence of an alternate dispute resolution clause or an exclusive jurisdiction clause, then uh, proceedings will have to be filed in the jurisdiction where the cause of action or where the part of cause of action is arisen. Excellent. Thank you very much, Manisha. Um, we've had a question in from Niran Jan, who asks, which one would prevail if there is a conflict between an interim order passed by a court and an interim emergency arbitrator's order, where both orders are passed contemporaneously or simultaneously in relation to the same underlying dispute? So a bit of a technical question there. Um, you should be able to see it in the chat as well if you would like to read that question um, before answering. But once again, I open it up to, to anyone who'd like to answer that question. Niran Chan, thank you. Krushi, would you like to take that? Yeah, I'll actually take that. There was, um, there was, there was one case where this where this particular point was actually taken into account and the indian court had in fact made a note of uh, the emergency uh, award that was already passed by the emergency arbitrator and since and it was it was and an observation was made that since the party is sufficiently protected by the by the emergency award at that time the uh, the court declined declined to give to give that extra added layer of protection. So courts, whilst interfering when uh, interfering in these kind of matters and exercising their jurisdiction under Section Nine, have also been mindful to not overstep or not override the orders that have already been garnered by a party. Excellent. Thank you very much, Krushi. And once again, if you do have a question, please do send it into our panel. We have about five minutes um, before we wrap up today. Um, do you have any AFSA awards um, enforced in India? No, actually there are no known cases of those awards being enforced. I haven't come across one either. 
Excellent, thank you. We've just had a question in from Tripti, and they ask, does the latest development on stamping laws also impact foreign agreement? The answer to that would be yes, it does impact foreign agreements as well. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Pooja. And um, I will say, if you do require any further information to any of these questions, please do get in touch um, to Paranan or to any of our panel today. We will be circulating their contact information for you after the webinar, so please do get in contact for um, any further discussions that you need. Um, Sharji asks, um, please enlighten on the reciprocity policy in enforcing foreign awards. In the absence of reciprocity between the countries, is the award creditor left remediless? Well, uh, the, the, uh, the, the award creditor is not left remediless. However, uh, the procedure is not as simple as it would be if uh, the award was made in a country that was a reciprocating territory. Um, you would have to then uh, file the award um, in the form of a suit to seek recognition of the award and then enforce it thereafter. So it would be a much longer process that would be governed by the Civil Procedure Code, read with the Arbitration Act. But those awards can definitely be enforced in India. Excellent. Thank you very much, Pooja. Um, are SIAC, so Singapore Rules, still the best option for international arbitration? Yes, I'll take that one, Dan, thanks. So the SIAC rules, as we call them, the Singapore International Arbitration Center rules, um, I think they're considered to be one of the best options for international arbitration. Um, this is simply because they are very flexible, efficient, and cost-effective for the parties. They also offer a high degree of confidentiality and finality to the proceedings. Uh, and it also allows the parties to tailor the arbitration process to their specific needs. And they have strict timelines. Uh, that means the parties, the arbitrators, and any witnesses who wish to testify in the arbitration are not allowed to disclose any information. So confidentiality is also, if that's a concern, that's also well protected. So uh, in general, I would say, yes, they are one of the best options for international arbitration. Brilliant, thank you very much. Um, looking at the time, um, I think that we will need to wrap up now, but what, what I'd like to do before um, we finish, and Pooja, perhaps if I ask you first, but of course open this up to anyone who has any comments. Um, Pooja, if there are any sort of key takeaways that you would like our audience to leave today's session with, um, please could you share those with us? And of course, as I say, that's open to, to anyone that wants to share their thoughts or comments, any key takeaways from today's session. Well, uh, Dan, I think uh, in terms of key takeaways, the uh, like like we uh, like we said while ending the session, it enforcement of a foreign award uh, is is getting easier and easier in India every day, uh, as the government, uh, the legislature as well as the judiciary uh, adopts a more a pro enforcement approach towards uh, foreign awards as well as domestic awards. Um, uh, arbitration is definitely uh, the future for India, uh, given its vast population and you know the the burden that there already exists on the existing judicial machinery. Um, at the same time, uh, like we spoke about during the webinar, uh, using tools like uh, interim measures, uh, applying for uh, filing applications under the Contempt of Courts Act. Um, uh, exploring avenues where uh, foreign awards could be enforced against uh, group companies or non-signatories to arbitration agreements um, using the tool of an emergency arbitration. These are all very handy tools that will help you really navigate um, uh, the, the arbitral framework within the country. Um, so the intention of the webinar was to really throw light on how arbitration can be more effective 
uh, in India. And um, if you are part of an, uh, an international commercial arbitration, um, uh, going after uh, the assets of a judgment debtor in India uh, are, is fairly easy. Um, provided that you're able to really harness the tools that are available under the law. Brilliant. Thank you for that, Reema. Uh, uh, Pooja, sorry. Um, so now we've sort of reached the end of the webinar. I would like to once again thank you all for your insights today. Um, really fascinating to hear from you. We really appreciate your time and for being with us today. And of course, thank you to our audience for joining us today and for all of your questions. If you did send in a question that we didn't have time for, um, please do reach out to our panel to Paranam Law after the session and they will be sure to be in touch. So once again, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much to our panel and I wish you all a lovely rest of your day. Goodbye.